go through basically the rest of the most important parts of Greek civilization. Uh, so we'll get into some of their philosophical stances. A lot of uh, Greek philosophers become known as the, the basis of Western philosophy. Uh, so we'll talk about Socrates and a bunch of others just real quick and go through some real basic definitions of uh, how they view the gods and the natural world and uh, what we today think of as like the scientific method. And then we'll get into kind of political ideas, political ideologies, and then we'll get back into uh, kind of the real world politics of, uh, of the Greek world, especially coming out of Macedon. All right. Um, generally, the Greeks believed that uh, the world was made by a series of gods uh, before humans were around and that those gods often fought each other. Uh, get, if you ever read Greek mythology, a lot of it is really pretty wacky. Uh, gods are often uh, almost like human-ish. Uh, they have kind of human emotion and human uh, motivations. Uh, so a lot of Greek mythology is some gods like to party and get drunk and they do crazy things and that has a big impact on uh, you know, floods and mountain formations, all kinds of things. Uh, and some of the gods are not full gods all by themselves. Like uh, if a Greek god gets drunk and has sex with a cloud, then the, the baby that's born is like half cloud, half god. It, it's some, sometimes it really gets kind of strange. And there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of those stories out there. Uh, because they were around for a, a long time, and they, the more they saw of the natural world, they made up all these legends about why this stuff happened. Uh, so a lot of these gods are driven by uh, vanity, or greed, or lust, or all the kind of uh, uglier sides of human nature, basically. Um, so Dionysus was the reported god of basically partying, uh, god of wine. So... Uh, and he is a kind of like chaotic figure amongst all the other Greek gods. Uh, there's other Greek gods that are like the gods of order and stability and predictability, and so they often fight with Dionysus. Uh, some gods betray other gods and they have to be punished, and that's what a uh, lacoon is. It's a kind of human form type of god who... Uh, revealed some kind of secret to another god and therefore he kind of like got dragged down into the underworld. So there's all that kind of common backstabbing that we previously talked about with uh, Greek politicians and city leaders and whatnot. Um, some Greek philosophers start thinking and talking and writing about how all this existence occurs uh, how physical objects are made, what they, where they come from, uh, how, how can you have these like seemingly solid materials that seem to change or evolve over time. So they're interested in kind of long-term, uh, like worldly history, a history of stuff. And one of the big ideas they came up with, uh, this group called the Monists, are, is this idea of substance. Uh, this group argues that there's like one underlying material that is the basis of all physical things you see and feel and touch and all that. So they call this substance, it's, it's the thing underneath everything that you see. Does that make sense? And that's why they use the word sub, it's underneath. Um, so that there's a, like this one element to them that makes up the entire physical universe. And that all physical objects are different kind of stages of substance. For example, um, if water is a substance in different forms, in different stages, water can be a gas when it's evaporated. It could be water vapor. Or it can be ice when it's solidified, when it's frozen. But we recognize water as being the substance of ice. Does that make sense? Uh, 
Uh, the problem that they recognize with this theory is that uh, we cannot, as humans, see or define substance. We see the object, but not the substance underneath. Does that make sense? We see the different forms. That's what our senses, uh, sight, hearing, touch, smell, taste. Um, and so they get into a big argument, amongst themselves even, uh, how valuable is this substance if it cannot be tested, if it cannot be analyzed. So that's one kind of strand of philosophy within ancient Greece. These monists who believe in substance and they try to figure out some way of gaining knowledge about substance as much as they can as the building block of the physical universe. Does that make sense? Yeah. What was their main, why did they want to figure this stuff out? Like, how come all of a sudden people are not? It's, it's like trying to, it, to them it's the mystery of the universe. It, it's pure research and they want to know. And how come all of a sudden, like, for all these years, just well, they just it's not suddenly that they're talking about this stuff. It's most likely that in a place like Athens, it's suddenly more permissible to talk about it. Whereas in other, in dictatorships, a lot of these dictatorships are built around religious ideas, and so they punish people for asking these kind of questions. So suddenly, in a place like Athens, you have this kind of freedom of speech. You can ask these questions without government punishing you. And so a lot of these philosophers come out of Athens itself. So maybe the question's been around for a long time, they're just not willing to meet in groups or talk about it publicly. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Nope. Oops, okay. Uh, Anasimides is one of the kind of bigger philosophers uh, especially about substance, and uh, he really criticized this whole theory because he says if you cannot prove that something exists, then why do you believe it, basically? You cannot propose an idea unless you can prove it. which was an idea that outraged a lot of people who be believed in substance and uh, kind of used that as the basis of their worldview. Um, but this is a scientific-ish type of question. you shouldn't believe it. That's, that's his basic idea. And it's tough to prove all that stuff about the gods. A lot of stuff is mythology or legends or whatever you want to call it. And you can see Anasemenes dies uh, when Athens uh, is just getting its, its uh, democracy going. So he spends his whole adult life in the, the previous time Uh, which, you know, the next step is exactly the question you asked, basically. Uh, if, you're, if you cannot prove that substance exists through human observation, then what makes this belief in substance any different from all these mythological gods that people are talking about as the cause of all this stuff? But again, they don't have any evidence for that either, so why should you believe it? And you know, a lot of the monists were saying that their belief in substance was a kind of scientific study which gave 
a uh, much better definition to the physical universe rather than just saying the gods did it. So the monist said that substance is like a scientific level of progress up from the mythology. Does that make sense? And Anna Seventy is pointing this out, saying, well, you're basically taking substance on faith too. If you can't observe it, you can't prove it, so why do you believe this either? And he said, this isn't progress from the mythology at all. It's just another mythology. Does that make sense? All right. Um, other Greek philosophers get into this idea of uh, change in the physical universe. Um, a lot of them start making big statements that, well, some of them say that uh, the, the physical universe doesn't change, it's all substance. Other philosophers say that uh, the substance does change, and that change is the natural kind of driving force of the physical universe and even of human history eventually. Um, and Heraclitus, his big idea is that kind of geographical evolution, the creation of these mountains or the river that runs through them or the forest, that, that stuff happens over eons of time. That is so long that we don't see that change happening quickly enough in our short human lives. So we walk outside our houses and we look here and there's a giant mountain and it's been there all of our lives in basically unchanged form. So some philosophers argue the mountain's always been there and it never changes. Whereas Heraclitus and like today's geologists and whatnot say, well, it does evolve and shift over time it's just that it happens so amazingly slowly according to our lifetimes that we don't see it happening. Therefore, we don't think it's happening. Does that make sense? So Heraclitus and others argue that uh, change is constant. It's just that a lot of this change is so slow we cannot see it in our daily lives. And his big philosophical statement is you could never step in the same river twice. So if you go over to like the river by like Baldy Mountains or something where the lake runs, you call it the same river, you step your foot in it, you're in the river, you could go back two weeks later and step your foot in the same place, but it's not the same river it's not the same water that you're touching. Because the water that you touched two weeks ago has flowed on, it's gone. Does that make sense? The river has evolved. So even if you go to the same place on the map, it doesn't mean you're touching the same stuff because things are always moving. It's constant motion. Does that make sense? So. I don't know if you ever heard that quote before. That, that's one of the big ones in Western philosophy, at least in the ancient world. All right. Um, other side of this argument about natural change in the world, uh, Parmenides said that change doesn't make any sense. He says that the natural universe has to be kind of static because where does change possibly come from? He says if it's all the same kind of physical objects that are just kind of being reworked and evolving over time, he says that's not really changed because it's all the same physical building blocks of everything. So one day you could look at it and it's a, a rock on the side of the mountain. Maybe someone picks up the rock and chisels it and makes a desk out of it. Parmenides says that's not change because it's still the same kind of fundamental, fundamental physical stuff. Does it make sense? You just altered its shape or something like that, but it's still the same stuff. And the pieces that you carved out, that you cut off of the rock, that stuff still exists. It may be in dust form or in little pebbles that you kind of toss to the side, but that physical stuff is still there. It hasn't changed. You've just kind of rearranged it a little bit. 
But he says, that's not really change. He says that the only way, once you have this physical world, the only way that change can exist is if you're making something out of nothing. And he says that's impossible. So he says uh, the idea of change over time is illogical, either way you approach it from. Were they both alive at the same time? Uh, I'd have to look up their years. I can't remember. And then they didn't have like fo they have followings too, like some Oh yeah, ideas. yeah. These these are just like the major teachers. They they have whole schools of thought that are dedicated to them. Yep. So yeah, we're just barely scraping the surface of this stuff. How do they make money? Uh, well, sometimes they're like public teachers. They, in the ancient world, instead of usually going to a school with a, a like salaried teacher that's paid by the government, um, a lot of times your family would hire a tutor for you. That tutor would sometimes stick around for like 20 years. So the tutor would be usually a, a middle-aged person that would start teaching the child at a young age, you know, five or six years old or something like that and might continue being that person's teacher until they get into their 20s or 30s, depending on how wealthy the family was. They could, and you know, the, the wealthiest families usually hired the tutors with the best reputation. So were these guys usually hired or hung out with their other people? They could, I mean, some of them are paid by wealthy people and they, they, that's how they make money. Uh, others, you know, basically go on tour with their ideas and they give public speeches and they raise money like that. Some try to write this stuff down in books and sell copies of books and a lot of the same kind of methods that a lot of scholars still use today. There's something out there called independent scholars. Usually if you go to a conference of scholars, uh, they'll have their little name tag with their name and it'll say right below like where they teach, what institution they're affiliated with, like who's paying them. But every once in a while you run into a scholar that they, they just write down independent scholar. They're not being paid by anybody. They have enough money or resources or something to uh, just do their own thing without having to worry about money. Some people are like that. They're, they're wealthy and they do what they want. They don't have to work. Sounds like a nice way to live to me, but I'm not there yet. I'm trying to get there. I'm not there yet. But yeah. So there's another side of this kind of argument, the, the anti-monist. People who believe in one thing are opposed by what becomes known as the pluralists, who believe in many things. So, two different kind of schools of thought. Um, the pluralists believe that there's also like this big physical universe that is made up of like the building blocks, the, the what the monists call the substance. They said there's only one substance. Uh, the pluralists basically argue that there's several different kinds of substance, and they start calling those elements or at least our modern translation of their word is elements. And the four major elements that they usually argue about, or try to argue to defend, are uh, earth, fire, wind, and water. They said that all the physical stuff that you see and experience are some kind of combination of those four. And depending how much quantity you have in one object out of earth or fire, it makes up different kinds of objects. Does that make sense? So in Western philosophy, those are the four original natural elements. And scientists ever since have been adding on to that list. So uh, how many elements are there today? I can't even remember. 100 and yeah, 100 something, 115 or something. And that was 20 years ago when I was in high school. And more of it that defined sense, I don't know. I don't keep up with that stuff. Some elements are fairly new. They've only been around for the last few decades since they started splitting atoms and finding new stuff. Or fusing atoms and creating new stuff. Does that make sense? So again, we're just barely skimming the surface of a lot of these arguments. Um, now you get into uh, ideas about history, which historians are always interested in. So a lot of historians uh, locate their, or bring the history of writing history 
uh, all the way back down to, especially in, in Europe, amongst European historians, they often talk about Herodotus as one of the first major historians in all of human history. Uh, Herodotus lives at the time of the Persian Wars, so when the Persians were invading Greece. And Herodotus basically wrote histories of those events that uh, basically said that the Greeks won those wars because of Athens. Because Athens had democracy and had more freedom than uh, people living in the Persian Empire. And that convinced the Greek soldiers to fight harder and figure out a way to win to uh, defend their freedom, basically. And Herodotus' big statement about human events, especially like big events like wars, um, are that these events are driven half by human decision making, by individuals or groups of people that want to do something and try to figure out a way to get it done. And the other half, Herodotus said, is luck. Because you can make a decision to do something, doesn't mean it's going to happen like that. Like if I make a decision to get my car and try to drive home, but suddenly there's a snowstorm, he says that's the interaction of human desire, human will power, uh, running up against bad luck. Does it make sense? And other historians argue that a, a lot of luck is really just other humans making an opposite decision to try to stop you from doing what you're trying to do, or your group. So some historians argue that it's not like the Persians decided to invade and they just got unlucky in their invasion and that's why they lost. Uh, other historians argue that the reason they lost is that the Greek people decided to rise up and try to defend themselves. But sometimes can be luck. I mean, if, if you have low tide when you want to attack, that's not really going to work. So this argument goes on and on and on. So Herodotus is one of the first kind of big names in amongst historians. Uh, the really big one for especially the Peloponnesian Wars is the Cydides. So he lives during the Peloponnesian Wars and uh, he's often called a historian. Some historians call him more of like a journalist because he's writing down histories of the events as they're unfolding. Which a lot of historians argue even today, or especially today, should not be done. Uh, a lot of historians do not want to touch any events in the last 30 or 40 years. Why not? Uh, for a bunch of different reasons. Um, number one, a lot of today's historians uh, mostly want to rely on archives to prove their ideas one way or the other, right? Archival evidence, internal documents in governments or companies or something like that. Um, and a lot of those government archives especially are not open for decades after the events. Like can you, as a researcher, you can write a letter to the CIA and ask them to go do research in their archive uh, to find out how the decision was made to invade Iraq in 2003. Is the CIA going to let you in? So like you're saying uh, historians rather get stuff from the government that was left behind. Well, depending on the question they're asking. Yeah. If there, there's different fields of history, basically, and one field is like what we call political history. Uh, how did governments make these decisions to do certain things? What was the internal, like, secret stuff going on that doesn't get reported in the news? Um, there's other kinds of historians that study uh, history of how individual companies made certain decisions to build a building or, or to build a factory. Uh, other historians study uh, if the government makes a decision what do the kind of average people in a certain place think about that decision? Do they actually follow that law or do they just not give a damn? So those historians, they don't really have to rely on government archives. They often do interviews and they read uh, like personal letters and whatnot of people living in that place in that time to try to like get a window into their, their thinking. 
It really depends on what kind of question you ask. So, yeah. And then there's histories of individual people, right? Biographers. Some biographers write histories of average individual people as an example of this is an average life in Los Angeles during World War I or something like that. So, it depends. All right, uh, well, he's writing this stuff down as it actually happened, so a lot of historians actually call him more of a journalist. Um, most of his history is focused on human decision making. He wants to eliminate the gods, eliminate luck. He wants to take it down to the level of who has power, uh, who has, or what groups have power and can inflict their will on governments and you know, get what they want. Um, and he is really critical of individuals. Uh, he says that people are basically uh, greedy and violent and angry and uh, really pretty bad people. And he says basically that's general human nature. Um, if we could get away with it, we'd be killing each other to get as much as we can for ourselves. Um, and he says human nature doesn't change. That, that's the way humans are throughout all history. Uh, so that's the kind of foundational idea of his histories. And especially the people that tend to rise in government, they are the most brutal and cutthroat to get to that level in the first place. Uh, so basically says most governments are led by a pretty untrustworthy, uh, despicable type of people. Does that make sense? So that's his view of government. Um, he says that, yes, you can have luck or chance. You can have storms that hit the invasion fleet and cause all kinds of damage. Um, so humans don't control everything. They just control a lot of things. Probably control the majority of things. Um, right down to the like the clothes you wear, what building you're sitting in now, how the city is even here in the middle of the desert. Uh, this all has a history. And he would say, if you go back into that history, you'll probably find that powerful interest groups made big decisions to, to use money to build these buildings, to build this city, to, to put people here. Does that make sense? All right. So that's the Cities, and he wrote really, really big books, mostly of histories of the Peloponnesian Wars and the different leaders of the different cities and whatnot. All right. Uh, then there's political philosophers. Um, a lot of philosophers really question uh, their own biases or talk about the fact that we all have certain biases that professional historians and other intellectuals try to eliminate as much as they possibly can, but most of us admit that it's pretty much impossible. We have our own personal things and desires and histories. Uh, and we kind of view the world through that, for, through our own personal lens. So some start asking, can you remove all biases from your analysis? Is it even possible? And today, most of us say no. Uh, but the Greeks took that to another level, saying, well, if you can never eliminate all of your own biases, then can you ever arrive at any level of like objective truth. And uh, I think most of us today probably argue no. The best we can do is uh, read all the sources we can get our hands on for a certain question or topic. Read all the perspectives and make up our own minds as well as we can according to what we think the truth of the matter was or is. But that's difficult and it takes time. And you'll find that out if you go on to university level and you know, study a certain topic or a certain discipline in, in depth. Um, okay, moving on. Um, there's another group of kind of philosophers that call themselves the sophists. Uh, they basically say that there's no such thing as objective truth that doesn't exist. Uh, we're all kind of driven by our own biases. So if there's no objective truth out there to attain, then why even try? 
So the most important, the best thing you can do in life is to learn how to convince other people to accept your ideas. So the sophists are good at argument. That's their goal. Not train people to find objective truth, but train people to make strong arguments to convince others that they are right. That their own perspective is correct. Does that make sense? So they study the kind of art of arguing. And Protagoras had one especially kind of big idea. Uh, his big quote is, man is the measure of all things. So you as an individual, your own perspectives and your own ideas about life or the world or whatever, um, your own world view impacts what you see as truth. So you'll go through life hearing all these different arguments and you tend to believe the ones that reinforce what you already believe. Does that make sense? You have a set worldview going into the debate and you tend to agree with the debater that mostly reinforces what you already believe. Which can be a pretty ugly thing, especially for people that are supposed to be kind of free thinking and self-critical and whatnot. And that basically begs the question, can you ever get out of, get outside of your own mental box? Your own intellectual beliefs? Can you ever see, really see anything well from another perspective? And that's one of the giant challenges for historians and other intellectuals even today. And you can definitely see it in party politics, right? They just kind of advertise their ideas to their own followers that already believe a lot of this stuff. And that's what... Uh, my parents at least used to call preaching to the choir. You just keep telling people what they already believe and it's not much of an argument anymore. And that can build up some pretty fanatical followings. Does that make sense? All right. And that's where Socrates comes in and uh, demands all this internal questioning of your own assumptions, uh, your own beliefs, your own motivations. So Socrates is participating in all this and um, Socrates running around in Athens uh, seemed to get his greatest joy out of really attacking the assumptions and the belief systems of almost anybody he ran into, no matter what that belief system was. He would ask you what you believe about a certain thing, and he, if you told him, he'd say, why? Why do you believe that? And he would basically keep asking that question, why, 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 until he got right down to the core and he would often argue, you, you believe this because you want to believe it. Not because it's either like true or provable or that you have any evidence to prove it. You believe it because it's something that you either enjoy believing or it's comforting to you. Which is an emotional thing, not really an intellectual thing. Um... So he loved attacking belief systems. And he rarely, if ever, tried to replace your belief system with a new one. He just wanted to get you questioning. So a lot of people got really angry about that because he's going to different political parties, different ideologies, and just basically trying to break them all down. All these belief structures. take it all apart. So he insulted all kinds of different interest groups, all kinds of different leaders. And uh, a lot of them really hated him for it. And the only people that really kind of follow him are the people that want to do the questioning. They're not ideologues themselves. So they don't really propose solutions. They just propose questions. And uh, he reportedly called this, quote, the source of my unpopularity, because he's 
bugging the crap out of people on a daily basis, year after year after year. And um, stories start circulating that um, he kind of doesn't bathe very often, so he's kind of smelly. And that's how much people start to hate this guy. They kind of personally insult him. He's got food in his beard. He's kind of Did anybody ever question his beliefs? We didn't really have many big beliefs to question. <laughs> that's the thing. So it's like if you're a member of a political party and someone comes up and starts like attacking those beliefs that are the basis of that party, and you say, well, what's your solution? What do you think we should do? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm just asking the question. Right? That could annoy a lot of people. Because a lot of people want ready, set answers to believe in. So especially as Athens, you know, basically lost the Peloponnesian War, uh, a lot of the city authorities and even the assembly, uh, they're looking for someone to scapegoat. They don't want to take blame themselves for having proposed these disastrous policies that have destroyed their city and caused all this plague and famine and whatnot. So uh, right at the point when they lose the war, um, they take a vote in the assembly to bring charge against Socrates for corrupting the youth. That's the official charge. That's the law he's broken. He has spread all this corruption by asking these questions to the point where the society was so corrupted it couldn't defend itself, and that's why it lost the war. Not because these moron politicians voted to keep fighting, even though it was hopeless, or voted to go out and actually fight the Spartan army and got massacred. It's not their fault, it's Socrates, which is a pretty ridiculous thing. So they put him on trial, and they do find him guilty, and they execute him. And that's how he exits the world. So no more Socrates. Does that make sense? Yeah. Did any of, like, his goal was to get people to start like, critically thinking, right? Yep. So, uh, did he achieve that goal, or did he just piss people off? Well, he pissed a lot of people off, uh, but a lot of others follow him. He has a really dedicated following. He has, like, all kinds of students that hang out with him, and they kind of learn from him and debate with him, and uh, they go off and become their own major philosophers in their own right. Yeah. So it angered a lot of people, but not everybody. So it kind of, like, starts, like, Seeds, which kind of yep. on. That's what he said. Question? Yeah. So, yeah. He, so his main focus was just destroying or kind of solidifying your view on the world and just continuously questioning. Questioning. He didn't have like anything other than that. So like, oh, it's to achieve like the ultimate truth or anything. He just his main point was to well, just question everything. He said, the more you question, the more you learn. So. The more you can defeat your assumptions, the closer you get to some kind of truth about something or other. It's like peeling away the, the, the onion of the, the layers of uh, lies and false beliefs. And hopefully at some point you get to some kind of core, some kind of core truth. But I don't know if you ever believed that that was really attainable. But again, he's just one of many philosophers, especially in Athens. Um, his most famous student is Plato. Uh, so Plato is about 30 years old or so when Socrates is executed. And Plato has spent many years with Socrates, and Socrates is like his father figure. So Plato is really, really angry and despised the political leaders who brought the charges against Socrates. Um, so Plato was really kind of harmed by this. And Plato tries to solve this kind of conundrum of questioning versus authority. So Plato eventually comes up with this idea that uh, there is a core truth to understand. And we all understand it from birth. And Plato called this the, the innate idea. That there are certain ideas that God or the gods or nature or whatever kind of puts in human brains from birth that they understand. And they, the ideas are usually pretty basic. Like Plato will walk around in Athens and a dog crosses the street and everyone says, well, that's a dog. Everyone seems to agree on it. So Plato would say that from birth we understand what a dog is. Does that make sense? 
from the moment we're born. It's it's one of those innate ideas that's in our brain. Did he mean the word or the idea? Like, we could identify a dog right from birth. Yep. We know what a dog looks like in all these different kinds of dogs. Uh, we understand that from birth. So it's that's something that's learned. It's something you just... Yep. It's something that's wired in there. The word as well? No, the word is something we learn. Yeah. The, the ability to identify it the is in there. Of four legs yep. and tail, what we call dog. Is what yep. we you have to learn the word. So right when you're born, you can't say dog. Right? You don't have the, the speaking ability, or at least most of us don't. Mm-hmm. It takes when, a while to build that skill. Dog, what, is it like mean? What, does that mean? what do you mean? Like, yeah. Everyone agrees that that's a dog. We must all have that idea from birth. It's not something we learn. Does that make sense? The problem with it, though, is most of us don't remember when we were so young we learned what a dog was. Most philosophers disagree with this now. They think that everything we, like, when we look at a dog, we learned at some point after being born that that's what a dog is. Does that make sense? But we're usually so young, we don't remember the day that we learned that that's a dog. We've just seemingly, as adults, have always known it somehow. Does that make sense? So that's, it's still a big philosophical debate. Some philosophers still go with this innate ideas thing. Um, They usually don't, use it with like dog or those kind of identifications. Uh, the philosophers that run with it today basically argue that we have an innate ability for language in our brains from birth. We can't use those skills yet. We have to learn all the different identifications and learn how to talk and all that, but it, it's in there from birth. You said it came before language? Like it's well, he's language. using it with identifications. So it's a little different. But most philosophers, they, they don't believe that today. They, they try to take it way, way back to some, something much more narrow. Say, that's innate. The, the ability for language is innate. The use of language is learned. Does that make sense? Because the, um, like the ability to identify something as a dog would come from language. So I would, where would you get the... Well, something? you could call it something. You can call but your ability to identify it oh, right. okay. is there from birth. You can call the dog a cat, but you know that the well, I mean, you cat call the cat something else. Yeah. But then you'd still be able to identify your dog or whatever cat as something other than. What you have the power of identification. Yeah. Unless you're blind. The ID. Yeah, oh, maybe you hear the dog. Yeah. <laughs> it's the concept, the idea yeah. of that he says. Yep. Yeah. And then Plato got into this other part where he said, "Okay, we can all identify there's a dog, um, but there's different kinds of dogs." So he gets into this abstraction is kind of a categorization of different dogs. Like some dogs are chihuahuas, some dogs are, I don't, know, I don't like dogs, what are other kinds of dogs? Uh, some are boxers, some are Great Danes, some are you know, German Shepherds. There's different kinds of dogs, does that make sense? So he looks at all these complexity of life forms and plants and all these other kinds of things. And he says, okay, there's, you can identify very specifically this specific kind of dog that has this specific color and all the color fur and color eye color and you can give an individual dog a specific categorization. But you can get more abstract and say Chihuahuas, Great Danes, they're all dogs. And you can get even step back further and say they're all animals. Does that make sense? And you can step back even further than that and say there's humans and animals and plants are all life forms. And he said at the highest level of that distraction, there is what he called the one great truth. There is one idea overhanging everything. Does that make sense? So there's one universal thing that everything else branches out of. Is that clear? That's his statement. And what do you think a lot of people associate that with? The one great truth. What is that great truth? God. God. So later, monotheists often take up his ancient writings and say he is arguing for the existence of one God. Which, if you read his stuff, he didn't say that, but that's what uh, a lot of people basically steal his statements and reinterpret it. Um, Plato also had political ideas. Uh, Plato 
and a lot of these Athenian philosophers, they think about all kinds of different things. They're what we today call Renaissance Renaissance people where they, they study all these different, what we think of today as like scientific fields. They, they study astronomy, they study mathematics, they study politics, they study geology. They do all these different kinds of things. So Plato wrote some important, or big stuff about politics. Um, his earliest writings on politics uh, seem to be really worried about democracy for what we think is pretty obvious reason, democracy killed his mentor. Right? The Athenians executed Socrates. Which was Plato's like father figure. So when Plato is fairly young, around 30 or so, he starts writing down these ideas about how democracy is actually pretty dangerous and untrustworthy. Because the majority in the democracy can do basically everything and uh, declare someone guilty of something they didn't actually do. As long as you get a majority vote. So Plato, in his earlier writings about politics, talked about democracy as a kind of near chaos. As long as you can convince a majority of the voters to support something, they could do all kinds of crazy things that are illogical and unjustifiable. And he called democracy kind of always on the edge of mob rule where people just get emotional and pissed off and they want to do something or punish someone for not even committing a crime. So Plato's solution to that was, he said, democracy is often very good because it gives freedom of speech and all these kinds of things. Um, as long as you don't say something really insulting to a lot of people, then you get voted guilty. But he said that politics should be run, government should be run by people with certain talents what he called natural abilities. So in his idea, like all of us have different things that we're just kind of naturally good at. Does that make sense? Like some people are really naturally good at fixing cars somehow. I don't understand how they do this. Or computers. Car doesn't start, they open it up and they fix it. They like seemingly just magically know what's wrong with it and how to replace these parts and get it going again. To me, cars are a mystery. If my car doesn't start in the parking lot, I call AAA because I don't even want to screw with it. I, I don't understand how the thing works. Right? All I know is I turn the key, I push the gas pedal, and it goes. If something in that machine breaks down, I'm lost. Same thing with the computer. I don't know how to fix these things. Plato said that basically the people that are really good at math and accounting, they should be the tax collectors of society. They should be our economists because they're good at that stuff. Um, people that are like naturally good at, at public speaking, they should be our political leaders. Does it make sense? People are like naturally good at fighting on the battlefield, they should be our generals. Is that clear? So he wanted to somehow like draft people according to their natural talents and bring them into government so that the government would run really well. And he called these people saviors, uh, pretty clearly, that they were like the saviors of society. They're going to run the place well for the benefit of everybody. What's the problem with that? Well, maybe they don't want to do it, but maybe they really do want to do it, and they want to do it forever. They can take over governments if they're that talented at stuff and that cutthroat, and sometimes you can't trust these people, right? Sometimes you put people in that level of power, and they love that power so much they don't want to stop. Does that make sense? And they could overthrow a democracy and build some kind of horrible tyranny just to keep power themselves. So his basic statement later on in his life is that uh, you, you can't trust anybody with that level of power individually because all people are corruptible. All people will kind of give in to their long-term desires, even their short-term desires, uh, their own personal interest in uh, perhaps oppress and do horrible things to everyone else. Does that make sense? So he never really figured out a reliable political system, and he kind of gets really cynical in older age. And uh, Plato's most famous student 
uh, is named Aristotle. So there's like three generations of major ones. There's Socrates, Plato, then Aristotle. Uh, so uh, Aristotle goes on into the kind of later, mid to later 300s. Ah. Um, Aristotle is really interested in this idea of what we today call kind of evolution, this constant change in the physical universe, uh, that the world is constantly becoming something new, something different, something else. So he talked about motion and kind of recreation of objects and whatnot. So uh, a lot of philosophers argue that his ideas are much more kind of open to interpretation and change. He's, he's able to change his mind more on stuff than especially Plato is because Plato based a lot of his stuff in just mathematics and like these rules that are stagnant and can never be changed. So Aristotle is often said to be kind of more free thinking. Uh, and that goes with his ideas of motion, basically. Um, the problem, though, for motion is that you can't really tell that things are in motion if you're in motion with it. Does that make sense? Like, if you've ever been on a, what are they called, merry-go-round? The little horses with little kids? When you're on the thing going in circles, does the thing you're standing on seem to move? No, because you're moving with it, right? Does that make sense? It's the rest of the world that seems to move around you. So his argument is if you're on the merry go round and you're moving with the whole system, how can you tell it's moving at all? So he posits the idea that for us to understand that there is motion going on, there has to be one point that is centered at rest, that is not moving. And he calls that the unmovable mover. And what do you think later people interpreted that to be? God. Yeah. The unmovable mover who created all this stuff and set it up and watches it in motion. And the rest of us, it's hard for us to tell that we're in motion because we are in motion. Does that make sense? Like the world is moving right now. You guys are aware of this, right? It kind of spins on its own. That's why we have sunsets and sunrises and 24 hours a day. The sun doesn't move all that much. And the earth itself actually moves in a big circle. So as we are in this room right now, you are in motion even though you're not physically moving yourself. And it doesn't feel like the room is moving, right? Unless we have an earthquake or something, who knows? But we're always in motion. We're never in the same place, even if we're standing perfectly still. Does that make sense? Or if you're in a car, you're moving with the car, it's the outside world that seems to be flying by. Inside the car seems pretty stable, hopefully. Maybe you're in a bad car, I don't know. Badly made car. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and since so many of these philosophers come out of Athens over these couple hundred years, um, later Europeans will look back to Athens as like the home of many of these major philosophies and will uh, really revere a lot of these philosophers. Uh, so this is a, a painting done in the 1500s after zero, so this is what, 2,000 years later or so, um, where they depict all these different Athenian philosophers as like hanging out in the same area of the city and like in this big conference and they're hang talking to each other. But most of these guys didn't even live in the same time with each other. Does that make sense? So this is like the community of ideas over hundreds of years. So later Europeans will almost worship a lot of these uh, philosophers um, as they come out of their own dark age. So we'll see this image again later as when we get to that point. Um, all right. So now getting into the kind of political world of governance and whatnot, uh, Athens is defeated around the year 400. Uh, its alliance system falls apart. Sparta seems like it's basically running the Greek world at that point. But then over the next few decades, there's a rebellion of their own allies, the Peloponnesian League, 
and uh, Spartan army loses its big battle in 371 that like, drags down Sparta. So now you have a collection of a lot of different cities that are all basically kind of equal with each other in power. No one or two really is pushing around all the others. And again, you have a thousand cities out there, so they're all kind of fighting each other and vying for power. Same old kind of Greek story we've been talking about for a while now. And the new source of power over the next few decades will actually rise in a place to the north, way up here on this map called Macedon, uh, sometimes called Macedonia, which uh, throughout Greek history up to this point is basically seen as a backwater. That's where Macedon is where there's swamps up there and forest and there's like these really uneducated, um, barbarous kind of people. They don't bathe well. They're like dirty, dumb people. Does that make sense? They're like, in the United States, like Ozarks people. You know what the Ozarks are? Where people will hang out chewing thistle and playing banjos and they got like four teeth, beard down to their belt. You've heard of this stuff? No? Well, they're backwoods kinds of people. They're intermarry with their own family. You, you've heard the stories. A lot of it is kind of almost boarding on racist against those arts people. Drink whiskey for breakfast, all those kinds of jokes. No? No? Hmm. Okay. Um, well, they are. The, the Macedon is like, it's, it's the backwater. The boonies where no one important really lives and no, no person that grows up in one of these cities that's educated, no one wants to go there. Because there's no like interesting people to talk to. They're just a bunch of hicks, basically. Oh, well, get outside of Los Angeles. Up where I live in the desert, there's actually are a lot of very backwards kinds of people that are kind of scary. I don't really talk to them. Um, they, they really do scare me. Um, so there's that. But uh, so that's what Macedon was for hundreds of years. It, it was like a joke amongst all the other Greeks. And Macedonia has one king uh, in the mid-300s that becomes obsessed of really kind of consolidating power and gaining control over all of Macedonia. And number two, building up their school system, especially building up their army to make them a, like a respectable place. Does that make sense? So he takes all these people that are basically illiterate and he builds schools for them and uh, built up the diplomatic corps and built up the strength of his government, the tax base, and all kinds of things. So Philip II of Macedonia is really responsible for building up his part of Greece into something fairly respectable. Uh, but the jokes about Macedonia have been around for so long that they're still pretty prevalent amongst all the Greeks. And say, so, yes, it's like, it'd be like saying, yeah, Arkansas is getting better, but it's still Arkansas, right? <laughs> if you go on vacation, do you want to go to Arkansas? Maybe if you want to see a whole bunch of, you know, trees and swamps and nothing. Does that make sense? Or if you're in Los Angeles, are you ever really motivated to go to Bakersfield? <laughs> no. So what the hell's in Bakersfield? We're in Los Angeles. We've got all kinds of fun stuff to do here. We don't even go to Bakersfield. No? It's impossible to find examples for you. He's building up political power, and especially military power. He's building up his army to the point where the Macedonian army will be bigger and almost as well trained as on almost any other Greek army. So they're kind of rising power. And Philip II wants to kind of unite all the Greek cities in one big project. One thing where he can gain influence over all of them and make Macedonia like the, the center of the Greek world. And his big idea is to get all the Greek city leaders together in one big conference and he pitches them the idea of attacking Persia. Finally paying Persia back for that invasion they launched against us you know, generations ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago by now. Um, and maybe conquer some land in it too. So finally destroy Persia, destroy the, this fear of another Persian invasion. 
basically saying, again, the, the best defense is a good offense. Let's go out and destroy the enemy and we won't have to worry about him anymore. And we'll unify our own kind of thousand different cities behind this movement. And uh, through threats and some bribery and whatnot, they all agree with it. They're, they're going to go off and do this thing. So they start making plans to launch this invasion of Persia. And then a funny thing happens. Philip gets assassinated. So he's out. And uh, Philip, he's kind of middle-aged. He has several sons. Uh, one of the younger ones is about 18 years old. And he wants to become the next king of Macedonia. And he's going to have to fight off a bunch of his brothers and have some of them killed. And he eventually, when he's successful at this over a couple of years, he gains the throne and he becomes known as Alexander III of Macedonia. And he's extremely young. He's at this point around 20 years old or so. And he wants to continue this unity of all the Greek cities. He said, just because my father is dead doesn't mean we're going to stop the invasion of Persia. He wants to continue it. Um, a lot of the cities that didn't really want to do it in the first place try to back out. So he takes his Macedonian army and attacks a city called Thebes. Uh, find it. Thebes is the, one of the leading cities at this point, and it tries to get out of this invasion. So Alexander sends the Macedonian army uh, south of Macedonia and invades Thebes and um, destroys it, wipes it off the face of the earth, kills virtually everyone that lived there and those who were left. He sold them into slavery. As an example to the rest of the cities, you're not getting out of this. And what do the rest of the cities say? Sure, sounds like fun to me, because I don't want to get attacked and massacred. Uh, so suddenly all these cities get back on, back on board with the invasion, uh, because he threatened them. If you try to back out like thieves did, then I'll attack you too and massacre all your people. So Alexander's not the nicest person in the world, um, but it's very effective for uh, some kind of leadership, leadership by threat, leadership by terror. And so uh, they will launch out, they declare war against Persia, and they're going to launch their invasion. Um, and Alexander is still extremely young. He's only in his early 20s at this point. Um, and in the early attacks, he actually leads his men on the battlefield. So he's not like one of these kings that just kind of stays off in the tent and watches the battle happen somewhere else um, while he's eating lunch or something. He's out in the front lines. And he has his bodyguards and whatnot, but it's still extremely dangerous. So what do his soldiers think of this? They love it. Yeah, they love it. Because he's sharing their risk. He's not just telling someone else to go out and attack, he's doing it himself. So he's a like this giant, like unthinkable hero to them. He gets wounded every once in a while. But he's out there uh, fighting side by side with his soldiers, which uh, usually you don't see political leaders really doing that. When he died, they made a coffin of him, and this is one of the images on the side of the coffin. He's out there fighting with his men. So this becomes legendary. And uh, he makes sure it becomes a legend because he has poets and writers follow him from battle to battle and watch him do this so they can write all this great like, romantic stuff about how awesome he is. Which uh, a lot of us historians call it propaganda, right? It's a government payment to writers to write something very favorable to the leader. Right down to the point of drawing it on the side of his coffin and the sides of buildings and all kinds of things. So how much of this is unbiased reporting and how much of it is uh, saying things because you're paid to say things? Does that make sense? It's what we today call political spin. You ever see all these people being uh, interviewed on TV 
about different politicians, uh, you can usually tell which politicians they support because they always say, say this person's absolutely he's a genius, they're godly. Um, we should all follow this person. Then the other person on the ballot, oh, that person's the absolute evil, they're going to destroy the whole world. You've seen these things recently? Yeah, it's pretty easy to tell which side they support because they are so obviously biased and they're basically propagandists. But there's all these kinds of statues and whatnot all over the place because um, he's not just leading his men in battle. He does it for a little while. He doesn't do it every single battle. After a while, he kind of stays out of it. Um, but he's also a military genius and that's a pretty well proven. Uh, his armies take on the Persian Empire, which is much larger, much wealthier, has way more soldiers, and Alexander never loses. Sometimes he takes on, his army will attack another army that's 10 times larger. He'll have 10,000 soldiers. The enemy will have 100,000. He wins. It's really pretty unbelievable. Um, and just go through the map really quick. Uh, they come, basically, they come out of uh, Macedonian era, their kind of unity Greek army, and they attack down into northwestern Anatolia, which is Persian Empire territory. Uh, they win a series of big battles, especially at Gordian, uh, and they continue down. They conquer all the Anatolian Peninsula. Then there's a gigantic battle uh, at a place called Issus, where the, the giant Persian imperial army came out to defend you know, the rest of their holdings, and uh, Alexander's armies won. The Persians retreated further east to try to go down into kind of the Persian homeland and defend that against invasion. Um, and most people seem to have expected Alexander to just continue attacking eastward to try to get into Persian in the war. Um, he seemed to be worried, though, that if he did that, then the Persian army in Egypt would launch a naval attack against Greece from behind. Does that make sense? Now that the Greek soldiers are kind of out of town. So instead of attacking eastward, he moves his soldiers south, and he attacks along the eastern Mediterranean, and conquers all those cities, crosses through... Um, I can't remember what the what that desert's called now. No, crosses the desert, gets into Egypt, attacks Egypt, conquers Egypt outright. Um, the Egyptians really liked him because it, they hated the Persians, um, and they declared him the new Egyptian pharaoh. So now he's pharaoh of Egypt also. Um, rebuilds his army with a lot of Egyptian soldiers who just love the idea of attacking the Persians and uh, comes back out of Egypt with an even bigger army and then launches the big invasion of uh, the Babylonian part of the Persian Empire. And there's a, basically a bloodbath of a battle at Gagamela. Uh, it's just a mass slaughter where uh, the Persian army's lost even more troops, so just almost by default Alexander's armies declared the winners even though they lose a ton of soldiers themselves. It's a really horrific battle. And um, from there, his, his armies attack south, right into Babylon, and conquer the city of Babylon itself. And he is crowned the new leader of the Babylonian state. And from there, he attacks directly into the Persian homeland. Um, the Persian emperor is assassinated. And uh, he conquers central Persia and is named the new Persian emperor too. Takes several Persian wives, which is something he's doing all over the place. Um, so he participates in all the religious and political and social ceremonies and taking over all these different places. And uh, back home in Greece, he's kind of criticized for uh, not really being Greek anymore. He dresses in Persian clothing, he has like a Persian entourage, uses Persian money and drinks Egyptian wine, all these kind of things. So a lot of people say, start whispering kind of quietly that uh, he's forgotten his roots. He's not really one of us anymore. Does that make sense? So that kind of stuff gets going, complaining about that back in, back in Greece itself. Uh, but he's not even done there. He 
rebuilt his army and wants to attack even further eastward. Um, is it the return route? Yeah, that's the return. So it attacks eastward and then goes north, and it really winded around. He doesn't really know where he's going very accurately. Uh, this is the edge of the known world to the Greeks. The Greeks haven't gone any further east than that. So he's kind of wandering around. And you can tell just by the route he takes, he's kind of going in circles sometimes. Um, and conquers big chunks of northern India, which is a whole different civilization um, that a lot of Greeks had never really seen before. And uh, after he gets to about this point, he wants to keep going. He wants to go until he gets to really the end of the world, the end of the map. He wants to conquer everything that's out there. Doesn't know how big the world is, um, but that's his goal. He wants to conquer the entire planet. And at this point, his soldiers basically are tired of this. It's been about 10 years of all this fighting, and they want to go back home. And so they seem to have threatened to mutiny um, that they'll overthrow him unless he decides to turn around and start heading home. And so he seems to make that decision about here, but he wants to see more stuff, and so he takes a different route, a southern route, to go all the way back. And gets back into Persia and throws a whole bunch of parties. We conquered the known world. And the uh, parties kind of continue as he travels further and further west and ends up in Babylon, where they have a, a gigantic party that lasts several days. And he appears to, uh, at least according to the legend, um, he was a big drinker with all of his generals and friends and whatnot and got into a big drinking contest uh, one night. And reportedly the next night, or the next morning, woke up with a fever. He got sick somehow from all his party and uh, died just a couple days later. So he's only about, I think he's like 33 years old, 32 years old, somewhere around there, when he died. Um, and they start calling him Alexander the Great because he conquered everything he encountered, everything that was known to be useful to conquer, everything conquerable, basically. And uh, it's, it's really pretty amazing because the Greeks have been fighting amongst themselves just in this little place for thousands of years and just in about a decade or so extends Greek control way 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 beyond what probably any Greek person had even thought was possible and uh, since he died so quickly I mean the guy's pretty young no one was planning on him dying for a long time uh, the people who inherited this gigantic empire basically carve it up into its individual pieces and tries to appoint regional governors over each piece in the decades after his death. And that falls apart pretty quick. Because when you appoint Persians to run the Persian area and Egyptians to run the Egyptian area, they don't really want to run it for the Greeks. They want it back for themselves. Does that make sense? So over the decade or so after Alexander's death, uh, his whole empire kind of collapses into its individual civilizations. And even the Greeks go back to fighting each other within their own cities. So even a unified Greece breaks down and they go back to their just normal thousand city interfighting. Yep. And what was like his goal from this conquest? Conquer everything. I mean, he's one of those people that like it's not gonna help More interested in conquering than actually governing. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. So he doesn't have like a, a great program for enlightenment or teaching or social benefits or anything like that. He's in it for his own reputation. And in the ancient world, you leaders got a reputation by you know, conquering more lands and bringing more prosperity to their own people or to themselves. <laughs> 